All right, today we're going to look at another application. And with all these applications, you know, the, the specifics of the application is less important than the new techniques and concepts that it introduces to you. So you need to, you need to be able to take the new concepts that are introduced in these and sort of run with them and adapt them to get to work uh, in your own programs. But this one allows us to create uh, fa uh, favorite Twitter searches. So we can search for something on Twitter and we can save it and then we can come back later and, and search for it again. All right. So we could store up, kind of like bookmarks, we could store up the favorite things on Twitter that we want to, uh, that we want to uh, save and search upon periodically, and then we can go back later and, uh, and re research them. So first of all, let's start out by actually running the application and, and showing you how it works. I'll, I'll fire it up, then I'll pass it around for, for everyone to look at. Um, let me make sure one thing real quick. We have the goofy we have the goofy uh, internet here, so let me just make sure we're connected to the internet. Also, let me make sure that I set this back to English, because when I was playing around last time, if you remember, We had set the language to French. I forgot to set it back. Wow, I know uh, I know it's Monday, but I can usually read better than this. So I can run it. We have a search query that we can enter in. And then we have a name that we can give our query. Um, you know, let's say we did a query for uh, Android, um, Android programming development. All right. We could simply save it under the name Android just to be concise. So we can, can give a name associated with the query. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a search for Android, a Twitter search for Android. And I'm just going to give it this, the, uh, I'll give AND as a tag for it, just so there's something different. And then click Save, and it saves that as a tag that I can search for. When I press the button then, it actually runs out to Twitter and does a search for that. So here's a list of all the tweets that someone has for Android, that someone has made for Android. I can go in and edit this if I want to. Maybe I want to uh, change the search to Android development. I'll change the tag to and dev. Then it'll go out and it will go and do the search again for Android development. All right. A couple things to notice about this application. First of all, elements of the GUI are created dynamically. All right. In other words, there's no buttons here, all right, initially. As we go in and edit uh, or, or add new search terms, new buttons get added. Right? <coughs> so that's a new feature sort of that we hadn't seen before. All the other ones, are, our UI was kind of static. I mean, we could change values of things, but we weren't adding new things to our, our UI. So that's one thing that's different. Um, other thing that's different is, let me go out and clobber this application. 
application. start looking at the manifest and really there's nothing to see here. So we're going to skip this. This manifest is very similar to the manifest that we saw in the previous example. Now, you might wonder why there is not a permission in here. I've talked about using the manifest to, to record permissions. This application runs out to the internet, obviously, to do the Twitter search. So you might ask yourself, why are there no permissions here to go to the internet? The reason is, is that this particular application doesn't access the internet. It simply calls the web browser. So the web browser is the application that actually uh, goes out to the internet. So because of that, this does not require any special permissions to access the internet. So the manifest pretty boring. All right, let's look in the resources file. And again, this is pretty boring until we get down here to the layout and the values. Notice there are um, 
a couple of things in, in the layout file where previously we've only had one um, XML file. We now have two XML files. All right. Let's look and see what those two XML files are for. The first one is the main XML, which serves a similar role as it did in the previous uh, examples. In other words, this is the main view of this application, of this activity. So this is the main screen that fires up when um, we first start the application. And we notice it's in a table layout. All right. Um, there's a series of rows. Um, there is a, a row for um, the entering in of the query text. There's a row for the entering in of the tag and the save. If we scroll down a bit, There's a row for our label. There's a row here that consists of a scroll view. And the scroll view is a portion of the screen which is going to be expanded. So, we've seen there's a there is the, the text view for the query, for the tag, for the label. Everything from here to here is that scroll view. All right? And if we clear to start out, well, it's already cleared, but if we were to clear it, all right, notice that there's nothing in there. But if we added enough um, queries, I'm not going to do that because it would be really boring to watch. But if we added enough queries, it would get to the point where that would scroll. All right? So we're able to go and we're able to dynamically add queries to the list. And we're going to add things to that scroll view. And if that scroll view gets filled up on the screen, a scroll bar will appear and we'll be able to add stuff to it. So in other words, this is a section of code right here that sets up that middle dynamic range, that middle range where we're going to add stuff to it. So we have a table row, because again, remember, our whole layout is a table. Inside that table row, there's really only one thing, and that is a scroll view. And the scroll view consists of simply a, a blank area that we're going to put this stuff in. Finally, then, we have, I think, one more row. To the table. And that is the row for the clear button to clear everything. Alright. So, the new thing in this is a scroll view. And the scroll view, as you might imagine, is something that we can add stuff to, and it gets to be too much, it will scroll. Now, what is what do you suppose is in this new tag view XML? We have a layout called the main XML. What do you think is in new tag view XML? Good question. All right. This is sort of the template for that new thing that we're going to be adding to the scroll bar or, or the scroll view. So in other words, we go in here and search for Android. Android development. I make my tag A-N-D-D-E-V. I save it. When I saved it, what happened? Got added to the scroll bar, or the scroll view. I'm going to probably call that a scroll bar the whole day. What got added? A button that takes us to the search for that particular search term, and an edit that takes us to where we can go and edit our search. All right. Every time we add something, the same things get added. 
those same two buttons get added. Okay? So, what is in this other XML file is the template for what gets added. In other words, the layout for each of those Twitter searches that we're going to add. In other words, those two buttons. So if we look at this, what do we see? We see this is a table row. All right. This view consists of a table row, right? Because what we're going to be sliding into here, what we're going to be sliding into, where do we go? What we're going to be sliding into that scroll view is a table row, right? The one thing that I forgot to mention is inside the scroll view is another table. So we actually have a little nested table going on there. All right? So we have our main table. One of the rows consists of a scroll view. And inside that scroll view, there's another mini table. And that mini table is what we're going to add rows to every time we add a new Twitter search. And this is the template for what is going to get added to the GUI for each Twitter search. So for each Twitter search, we're adding a row to that table that belongs to the scroll view. All right? The inner table, the nested table. And what do we add? Well, we're going to add a table row. And what's it contain? It contains a button that's going to have invoke the search. And it contains another button that will allow us to edit it. All right? So questions about this, because this could be a little confusing. We'll see how this works in action um, in a little bit. Remember that, you know, each of the components is pretty straightforward and pretty simple, but what you have to worry about, too, is how everything gets put together. All right? So we'll see how this gets put together. But in essence, this is a template, this is a layout for each row that we're going to have, um, each Twitter search that we're going to add. Now, we then have some more stuff in our values. And the more stuff in the values really extends the thought that we had last time in, in our previous examples as far as putting things in the strings file. If you remember, why do we put things in a strings file? We did it for maintainability, right? So that there'd be one place that we could go in and put, hey, you know, here is the... Uh, you know, here is the, 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 the name of the label that we want. Why? Well, again, that makes it more maintainable. We can go in and, and in one fell swoop, we can go and, and change everything. All right? We can also use that for localization, like we did last time by creating, say, a French or a Spanish version of this. We can go in and we can um, create a second version of this. And we don't have to go in and change all our code. We just change the list of hard-coded strings. Well, colors, as you might imagine, is a place where we can define colors. And di demen is where we can define dimensions of things. So let's look at the colors. And in the colors, we've defined light orange, all right, a resource, color. We're giving a name of light orange. That's a name we made up, all right. And we're giving it this value. All right, hex code just like you have in, in HTML. All right. So what that means is, is in any of these layouts, I can refer to that color as light orange. Let's see. I know we're using it somewhere here. Yeah, right here. The background of, of this table view, we've assigned a color of light orange. And we can refer to light orange as light orange, that name that we've given it, throughout our application. Why do we do that? Again, maintainability. What if, what if someone looks at this and says, you know, that light orange is a little bit too light. All right, make it a little darker. I could go in here in the colors view. And now make, maybe make it a little darker. And rerun it. 
And without me touching the code, everything that was designated as light orange will now get the new color associated with it. Which is virtually indistinguishable from the old color. <laughs> All right? I should have made it more dramatic. All right? But again, you get the idea. So I could name... I can just, in, in essence, I can make up my own names for colors, and then I can use those names in the GUI, all right? And I can keep things consistent then, you know? If you were going to imagine, if you did this, if you didn't do it this way, if you put in the hex code for every color, every place you add that value for light orange, you'd have to go in and change it to something else, you know, if you're going to change it. Or here, you can only change it in the one place, and um, that change will, will take place. Now, again... Here's the interesting thing, is we can localize this if we want to, all right? Um, different colors in different cultures mean different things, you know? Typically, um, you know, you know, a funeral in this country would be associated with the color black, and a, a wedding would be associated with white, all right? In other countries, in other cultures, that's not the case. Different colors are used. So if that became an issue, if that became relevant to your application, you could actually go in and change the colors uh, to match the locale. All right? um, you could do something like, you know, use the national colors for folks. You know? So uh, an application um, in the United States, you could, have, you could use red, white, and blue as your color scheme. All right? In another one, you could use, you know, in, in Mexico, you could use, what is it, red, white, and green, I think, all right, the colors of their flag. All right. Now, how would you do that? You wouldn't obviously call the color light orange. You'd call a color background, foreground, and contrasting, maybe. And then you'd set background of, make the hex code for white, uh, foreground, maybe make it blue, and contrasting, make it red. So you don't have to, like, give the exact name, you know. In this case, they use light orange, which, again, has a difficulty that if I ever wanted to change it from light orange to blue, it would be confusing. So I would prefer more uh, names explaining the function as opposed to um, the actual color itself, because I might want to change the color itself. That will be awkward to say that something that's light orange is actually light green, all right? Uh, if I say that this is the background color, however, the background color is always a background color, whether it be orange or green or whatever. All right, so we can do that with the color, all right? And we can also do that with dimensions of things. And in this case, we do it with the uh, dimensions of the button. Specifically, the buttons that are part of the scroll, scrollable, these things here. Now, again, we could set up a different one, not necessarily for different languages, but we could, based on different screen sizes or different screen densities, we could make a different size. Screen densities we're already handling by using DPs, but screen sizes, we could make a large button that would be bigger than the buttons that we make on a smaller screen. All right? This again, all these things are geared towards giving us the ability to make our application very flexible and very customizable given all the different platforms that um, this application is liable to run into. All right? So we're not hard coding anything anywhere. We're putting everything in these resource files, and then we simply point to those resource files and entries in those resource files um, as we develop it. If we look in new tag view, remember this is the sort of the template for those rows of buttons that get added. Notice that the dimension for these, again, is set to at demand tag button width. So I can go in, instead of hard coding in that it's 200 dp or 400 dp, I refer to it in the um, dimensions file, which means if I want to change it, I can change it and I can keep things consistent. 
or I could give different resource files for different um, size screens and so on down the line. All these things are done for that maintainability so that we can change things only in one place or make a second version for different um, situations and we don't have to change any of our code. The strings file is, if I am not mistaken, pretty much the same as the other one. There's different values, obviously, but it's basically just our, our list of hard-coded strings. Any questions at this point on the purpose of those resources? The one that I could see possibly being tricky would be that new tag view. All right, Just keep in mind, that's the pieces that are going to get added. That's the row that's going to get added to the scroll view every time we click add to add a new query. All right. What I want to do is I want to kind of trace every path through this application, all right, and, and look at it and review it. And we won't necessarily get to all of them today, but I want to trace through every sort of um, um, that someone might, might um, work through this application. The idea of like test cases or use cases um, is a good one for both design and testing. Has anyone heard that term before, a use case or a test case? What, what, is, what, is, what is a test case or a use case? You kind of identify the conditions you like to test and then you kind of walk through a script of testing it, whether or not it works, it works correctly, the way you have it designed or the way it's supposed to. And then whether it doesn't, and then how you want to fix it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good thing. A use case is one typical action that a user might take in the application. For example, if we were uh, writing Amazon's website, all right, we have a big task at hand. You can imagine all the different use cases or test cases. Generally speaking, a use case. The, the reason that there's sort of a difference between uh, the terminology is it's like at when, when in the process you're talking about it. A use case is sort of like when you're planning the application. How do you want it to work? All right. A test case is sort of like, okay, I've written the application. Let's make sure it works the way that I want it to work. So your use cases effectively become test cases. So one of your use cases for Amazon might be that the user... Um, creates an account, right? It's a typical thing that someone would do on Amazon. They'd go in, they'd, they'd go and they'd sign up and they'd put their information in and save. That might be one use case. Another case is someone might try to create an account for an email address that already has an account, right? I mean, I forget what I sign up for. Not necessarily Amazon because I use it a, a lot, but, you know, like, say, Barnes & Noble's. And please, if anyone from Barnes & Noble's watches, your store is great. I just don't use it as often as I do Amazon. I don't know if I have a Barnes & Noble account. I suspect I do, all right? But maybe I don't. So maybe I'd go in and try to sign up for an account. And typically for these, you put in your email address and your other information. Well, a second use case or test case may be someone going to register for an account that already has an account. So that's sort of a second use case or test case. And again, when you're designing it, you create the use case to say, this is what I want to have happen. Then after you've created it, you create your test case from it to say, is this what happened? And you go back and test it. So anyhow, use case, test case, there's scenarios that one might go through with the application. All right, what are the use cases here? All right, we could identify you know, probably four of them or so. 
Um, number one use case would be someone fires up the application for the first time.